After 40 long days of toiling under the gold dome, legislators are down to the final ticks of the clock of the 2015 session. They've passed a massive transportation funding bill. Sent to voters for approval, an initiative the governor says will rescue failing schools. They've sparred mightily over just who is protected and who might be hurt by a religious freedom proposal. And they're not done yet. We're live in the studio and at the Capitol as Sine Die approaches. Lawmaker starts right now. Good evening and welcome to Lawmakers. I'm Bill Nygut. We have made it. We're at day 40, the last day of the 2015 legislative session, and we are going to be here for a full hour tonight to uh, bring you the latest on what's going on at the Capitol. We don't know yet when the final gavel will come down, but Pat St. Clair is down at the Gold Dome right now tracking all the action ahead of Sine Die. Hi, Pat. What's going on down there? Hi, Bill. We are going to begin tonight with the Religious Liberties Bill, the controversial issue that's been on again, off again, on again, and off again. The sponsor, Senator Josh McCoon, came out fighting to keep the bill alive, first by attacking Georgia corporations like Coca-Cola, who have lined up against his bill. Some corporations have weighed in uh, against the protection of the free exercise uh, right here in the state of Georgia. And what I would say is when those corporations stop doing businesses, business with the Ayatollahs, when they stop doing business with countries where homosexuality is a capital crime, then uh, I'll be interested in their opinion at that point. But unless and until that happens, I don't really think what they have to say matters a whole heck of a lot. Following McCoon to the podium, Senator Nan Orock, who has consistently offered the other side. The international corporation Coca-Cola proudly headquartered here in Atlanta, issued a statement on yesterday evening in opposition to the state of Georgia codifying this measure and signing it into law. When Walmart, Coca-Cola, and Apple, among many, many others, such as Yahoo, Angie's List, uh, the list is growing by the hour. There's a strong, strong message that business delivered here to us last year and said, please, Home Depot delivered the message last year, Delta delivered the message, don't go down this road, don't take us backward. But it wasn't until the afternoon session that McCoon made his move, attempting to attach his bill to HB 71 on pardons and paroles. The bill that this Senate passed was word for word the language of the 1993 Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act. It's been in place for 22 years. It's been litigated all over the country. It's the law, the strict scrutiny standard that it adopts is the law in 31 jurisdictions. However, after stating his case for the bill again, McCoon quickly withdrew his amendments uh, because they were not germane to the parole bill. The now, opponents of the bill are pointing at what's happened in Indiana and Arkansas with similar bills. The corporate backlash has forced the governors of both states to send the bills back to the legislature to add language guaranteeing the bill won't discriminate against the gay and lesbian communities. With the passage of the transportation bill late Tuesday and the education bills earlier, Governor Nathan Deal has enjoyed a pretty successful session in the legislature. We sat down with the governor for an extended interview on the last 40 days here under the Gold Dome. I think it's been a very good session. Uh, the General Assembly has come to grips with some issues that some of which have been put off for a very long time. Uh, the Opportunity School District, which was one of the primary issues of my administration this year, uh, allows us to give the people of the state of Georgia the opportunity to vote on whether or not they think the state needs to do something about children who are trapped in chronically failing schools. Uh, that will be on the ballot in November of 2016, and I'm hopeful that the people of this state will agree with me, and that is that this is something that we need to fix. Uh, we should not allow children to be trapped. And by say trapped, I mean they are required to attend these schools. 
unless their parents are wealthy enough to pay for them to go to a private school. And most of those parents cannot afford to do that. Transportation, of course, is one of those issues that, uh, here again, has probably been postponed for a very long time. So I am very pleased the General Assembly has passed this transportation bill. Uh, it gives this state the opportunity to continue to be one of the leaders in terms of good transportation for our citizens. And that is, in many cases, the threshold to business growth. How much of a role did you play in getting the transportation bill um, passed? Because we know there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of behind the scenes going on. Can you, can you let us in a little bit on the behind <laughs> the scenes of it all? Well, my staff and I were always engaged with both the House and the Senate on the bill. Uh, and I was pleased that they were finally able to reach a compromise on it. I think it was a fair compromise. It is a legislative issue and uh, the legislators have worked their will. Uh, we have participated in the entire process and uh, I'm just glad we got it finalized. Well, what's the, the threat or the prospect of a special session? Did that um, kind of bring both sides together? Well, I don't know that uh, that did, but I, I think they understood that this was a matter of urgency and it was one that needed to be dealt with this session and nobody wants to have a special session. I certainly don't. Uh, I don't think members of the General Assembly did either, but I do think that coming together as they did reached a final product and that's at the end of the day that's what's important is that the product that was produced is something that will stand our state in great, in great shape in the future. Another bill you, you mentioned um, and that was your uh, Opportunity School District legislation yes. that did pass. Some skeptics are wondering what's the motivation behind that and why is it that you want to concentrate so much power in the governor's office. What can you say to reassure your critics about this legislation? Well, first of all, remember that the majority of funding for education comes from the state budget. And it is the largest single portion of every year's budget uh, is goes into education. Now, I'm proud that during my four years, uh, the percentage of general revenue that has been devoted to education is I think the highest of any governor in the history of this state. And uh, that is something that we have a vested interest in it. But if we have no say so in terms of chronically failing schools, now remember, that's a definition that says that schools have failed to achieve above an F for at least three consecutive years. Now, nobody should be satisfied with that. Many of those who say, well, we don't want the government, the state government intervening, let the local systems do it. It's the local systems that have allowed that to persist for at least three years. And uh, I think it was time that we acted. I have every reason to believe that the people of this state, based on the mothers who come up to me and say, thank you for caring about our children. I think that is sentiment will be expressed at the ballot box in November of 2016, and we will have affirmation that they think the state should do something about it. We also asked Governor Dill if he would have signed the Religious Liberties Bill had it made it to his desk. And he will also reveal what it is that sparks one of his strongest passions. We'll have that coming up for you a little bit later in our show tonight. Finally, an update on bills we've been following. HB 110, the fireworks bill, passed today. It will allow the sale of fireworks to Georgia consumers, the kind they've been crossing state lines to buy illegally for years. Also today, HB 213 passed. The bill will now allow MARTA to spend 50% of its revenues on capital projects and 50% on maintenance. But the Senate voted down a bill that would allow residents of South Fulton to vote for their own city. Two other city bills on Tucker and La Vista Hills are still being discussed in the House Senate Conference Committees. That is it for now, Bill. We'll throw it back to you. Pat, I know we're going to see you again uh, later in the broadcast, but this is as good a time as any to say this has been your freshman session as a reporter at the General Assembly, and we couldn't be prouder of the work you've done on behalf of GPB. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. We have a lot to get to tonight, including a number of lawmakers joining us live throughout the evening. 
Here with me tonight in the studio to discuss what's been going on down there, Loretta Lepore, a Republican activist and media strategist, and Howard Franklin. He is a Democratic consultant and strategist, and I'm very glad to have both of you here. You. We're going to start, though, uh, by talking to uh, the Speaker of the House, David Ralston, who is down at the Capitol. He is about to uh, finish up a dinner break uh, and get back to work in the uh, session. But uh, while we have an opportunity to talk to him, we want to do that. And I'm hoping that the speaker is uh, just about mic'd up. There you are. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for spending a few minutes with us. Well, thank you, Bill. It's great to be with you. Um, we appreciate it. Let me start with a bill. You, you know better than anybody that uh, sometimes the final hours of a session, things start popping up that you hadn't been anticipating. You didn't know were going to be on the radar. And suddenly today, SB 127, a bill which, as I understand it, essentially says that issue-oriented nonprofits must report how much money they have spent, are spending, um, to um, perhaps influence legislation to have an impact um, on politics. There's been a lot of criticism out there in the conservative blogosphere about this. What do you think about this? Is this an appropriate and an important bill to uh, uh, pass into law? I think it is both appropriate and important. I think that uh, the public is entitled to know uh, who is spending money to influence the election of candidates uh, or the defeat of candidates uh, in primaries and general elections. You know, right now, candidates have to report on like a quarterly basis uh, every contribution of more than $100, every expenditure of more than $100. But we have a lot of what I call dark money, uh, anonymous money that uh, uh, is coming into these races now uh, to influence these elections. Uh, and the public never has the information about who has the interest and who is financing these kind of efforts. This is not an effort to restrict participation by anyone or to limit what they can say or do. It's simply a, a, a let the sunshine in, let's be transparent, let's have disclosure so that uh, these groups are playing under the same rules that uh, the candidates themselves do. The uh, critics of this measure say that it is a violation of the First Amendment, their right to free speech, and there are some folks out there who think this is uh, could be challenged in court. Do, do you think that they're going to have a case? Well, I, I don't think so. Uh, I don't know that we're going to uh, uh, really put a lot more time in that tonight. I think that uh, we will continue to talk about it because I think it's important. And frankly, I'm I'm disappointed at some of the uh, of some of the groups that have uh, publicly uh, come out today in opposition to that. Many of these groups, uh, uh, you know, align themselves often with Republican causes, uh, and I, I want the Republican Party to be the party of transparency. Uh, let me make sure. I, I, go, I, let me make sure, though. If I'm sorry to interrupt you, but let me make sure. Did I just hear you say that you're going to uh, hold this off and take it up uh, in the 2016 session? Well, we, we've got a lot of other business to get to tonight, and I'm not sure that uh, uh, if, that we're going to get to it. If we don't get to it tonight, I think that it's something that we can discuss between now and uh, next session. And certainly, if we don't get to it tonight, uh, then I'm I'm hopeful that it will be taken up again uh, next session because I think. It improves government. I think it's uh, it's 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 good for the public to have this information, uh, and and so I think it is a good measure. Well, a couple other quick questions, Mr. Mm -hmm. Speaker, before you go back and get working again in the House. Um, it, Josh McCoon has been vigorous in his efforts to find a route for uh, RIFRA in the Senate tonight. Should we? And he hasn't gotten very far. Should we assume that RIFRA now is an, another bill that will now be held off till 2016 that isn't going to get action tonight? Well, we tried to move on that bill in the House, as you know. Uh, the House Judiciary Committee actually had uh, three hearings on the bill. Uh, it was uh, amended at the third hearing. Uh, uh, with an amendment that was uh, that won a majority of the votes, uh, and then it was tabled by the supporters of the bill, uh, and so it has remained on the table. Uh, uh, the leadership of that committee has worked uh, in the days since then to try to craft something that I think everybody can agree on. I know that uh, there's a lot of intense feelings on both sides 
uh, of the bill. Uh, I, I regret that something that, that, that ought to be good and positive has led to so much uh, division uh, and, and, and discord. Uh, I think that's regrettable. Uh, but we have a committee process and we have, uh, we have acted on that process in the House. Uh, it just didn't have the support to get out of committee without an amendment. And uh, so, uh, you know, we're, we were prepared to move forward. Uh, we're still prepared to move forward. But I'm not going to have the House committee process be so, subverted. So it's going to go. So it, it looks like uh, he couldn't find a, a way to amend anything, put it onto a bill in the Senate. We should assume that that's going to come back in 2016, not before midnight tonight, right? Well, I think it's getting a little bit late okay. for, that, for that measure. <laughs> I would have to, for it to come back, uh, the only way I would accept it coming back is for the House committee to meet. And, and we've got other measures we need to All take right. up, and I think we'll talk about it next year. Mr. Speaker, it's very, very uh, uh, kind of you to come uh, on this busy, busy night. What time are you going to get out of there? You're not going to be there till midnight, are you? Well, uh, I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm always hopeful that we won't, but, uh, you know, sometimes the forces of nature take over, and we just stay till midnight. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I hope you get a day to rest tomorrow, Mr. Speaker. Thanks for being thank, with us. Thank you, Bill. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Um, Loretta and Howard, you know, it's really interesting. This bill on nonprofits, which includes, I think, churches, if they uh, should print up a, uh, a list of preferred candidates having to report how much money they're spending, it's really ignited Eric Erickson, the red state blogger, and other conservative bloggers who are outraged by this. Well, there's been a number of these folks that have been outraged throughout the session on various <laughs> issues, which yeah. is what prompted the legislation in right. the first place. Right. But I think there's also the issue of the political process, right? So the election process um, outside of the legislature. So, you know, do you have to register as a lobbyist during the legislative session? And the speaker obviously early on challenged Grover Norquist to that as he was weighing in and advocating with members of the House. Um, and, and this issue seems to be more... Um, uh, directed at the election cycle, yes. um, where candidates should be able to know who is on which side and, and who's coming at them. So if these organizations do in fact um, represent hundreds of people, do they represent people that live in the district? Do they, who do they represent in that respect? I think their issue about free speech um, is, a, is an issue to take into account, but I think that, that this legislation is not limiting free speech as much as it is talking about the funding of free speech. Gotcha. Uh, real quickly, Howard, you know, this is another one of these issues where some of the more conservative members of the Republican Party or advocates of usually Republican issues are showing us there's a real split in the Republican <clears throat> Party right now. I mean, there is a real spectrum, but I think, uh, as Loretta said, I mean, we've had a number of big issues, whether they were uh, the campaign for governor last year, and we talked a lot about ethics, some of the issues with the Ethics Commission in the year leading up to that. But this is sort of the natural conclusion of a, a lot of discussions that started then, in my opinion. All right, stay with us. We'll come back, and we have a lot more to talk about with you. But, you know, one of the issues that we've spent so much time talking about, as everyone else has, is the uh, transportation funding bill. That transportation plan, almost a billion dollars, received final passage after a lot of debate late Tuesday night. Um, not everybody is pleased about what happened. Senator Mike Crane took a point of personal privilege this morning to say he thinks passage of the measure is a disservice to Georgians. Let's listen. Georgians are going to pay more taxes. This body, this state, this administration on the second floor has decided in their infinite wisdom that no matter what, you're going to pay more. It will cost you more to drive to the store. It will cost you more to drive to work. It will cost you more to drive to church. And you didn't have a say in the matter. Based on the projections I've seen with the new adjustments allowed to our tax, our fuel tax, 10 years from now, Georgians will be paying at the state level at least 40 cents a gallon in excise tax. Welcome to the legislative process. Senator Mike Crane is not alone. There are any number of Republicans, especially, who are very concerned, disturbed about what they see as a big tax increase for gasoline. Joining us now to uh, 
talk a little bit about what he might anticipate as this moves to a referendum the voters will have to agree on is one of the hardest working men in show business i don't think anybody worked a bill maybe a couple of others as hard as you did uh, representative jay roberts trying to get this transportation bill across the finish line thanks for being with us tonight i'm glad bill i'm glad to be with you here tonight and uh I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you again, as always. Well, thanks. Um, yeah, so let's talk about um, some of the grumbling. Uh, you, you're going to find there are going to be uh, some conservatives, anti-tax conservatives out there who are going to continue to uh, pound away at this as a big tax increase. How do you think that's going to set the debate that will uh, take place between now and when voters get a crack at this in uh, 2016? Well, you know, the uh, referendum would be for TIA or for T SPLOS if that's part of the bill. Uh, so that'll be up to each local community or each region as far as them putting it back on the ballot. Uh, you know, I think that there was a poll that came out today that showed that 67 percent of Georgians approved of the transportation plan. I think Georgians realize and understand the needs there. And while nobody wants to pay any more taxes, I think that they understand that the needs there and they're willing to possibly pay another dollar, maybe at the most, or a dollar twenty if you drive a truck like me, maybe when you fill up your tank of gas. You know, most people don't fill up, but maybe at the most 25, 30 times a year. And so you're not talking about that much money to, in, well, to improve education, I mean, I, transportation. Yeah, and, and I, sh I should have said that it is, it, but the reason I talk about the referenda is that it will be in the local communities and counties. The counties that have said they were worried that they were losing some of their taxing power, some of the revenues that come from it, and they're going to have to face this, and there's going to be a lot of criticism down the road on this. Well, I mean, th there, there's always going to be naysayers and, and people that want to criticize any plan that you come up with. You know, the local portion now, we went back, they continue to do just what they're doing today, uh, with the exception of they're being capped at $3. You know, currently they're about two and a half. So they're not even taxing it at the $3 rate. We just felt like at $3, that was enough. That was about $0.09 cent that they were going to be able to collect locally. We didn't want to allow them to continue to go up. And that's where our gas prices are higher than a lot of states anyway because of that local. So let me ask you a last question. Um, there are, uh, you, you had all hoped for, the leadership had all said you need a billion dollars a year in revenue. You came close, 900 million, but it's not a billion. Do you anticipate it is possible that in the 2016 session there will be efforts to find that extra hundred million dollars or are you all satisfied this is what it will take? Well, I think you look and see we've come up with about 900 million dollars in revenue then about now $175 million in bond that's in the budget, so that's over a billion dollars. I think you'll see that concerted effort as we continue to go around the road to look at the bonds. You know, I think the biggest thing in this uh, bill to talk about, Bill, is the accountability. If we don't spend the money where we say we're going to spend, it ceases to be collected on those local or on those additional fees. So uh, I don't know that there will be any kind of uh, uh, passion to come back and try to address this again next year. I think. We've put this issue to bed, hopefully, for, for years to All come. All right. Jay Roberts, get some rest. You worked hard this session. And uh, for those who are looking forward to seeing this measure pass, uh, congratulations. Thank you, Bill. I thank you. All right. Take care. Yes, sir. Uh, Howard, um, you know, again, uh, the, the, the measure passes. There will be interesting dialogue about local counties that want to increase their t and in, on top of this sure. state tax increase. But the bigger question, isn't it, is going to be how will this affect some of those Republicans who voted for it in their reelection campaign? I, I think you're right. But I will say, I mean, we're looking at fortifying roads and bridges. And I think most people would see that as a, a fashion or a faction of public safety. That's what government, first and foremost, is responsible for. And so if you have to pass taxes, if you have to increase taxes, doing it to ensure that, you know, motorists and Georgians are safe on the road is a really good reason to do so. You, are you saying you don't imagine that we're going to see some primary challenges? We absolutely of will. incumbents I'm, in the Republican Party? I'm, I think we see some every two years, so oh. I think this, won't be, this won't be much different. This is going to be red meat for some anti-tax Republicans, isn't it, it in, will, in primary it races? It will. In a, couple of, in a couple of districts, I think that you will see some challengers be put forth, which uh, may speak to the changes to SB 127 as well, so that people know where those challenges are coming from. Um, <laughs> but I think that... Um, 
you know, overall, you know, you've seen the polling, last two polls, February and then, then again this week, that most Georgians do support funds dedicated to transportation. And what Representative Roberts did not allude to or ex explain about the bill, too, is that every year the DOT is responsible for presenting a report back to the legislature about where the money is being spent. So I think for taxpayers, even those that, those that have reservations about this being a tax increase, um, there's, there hopefully will be some comfort in knowing that there is accountability attached to this. This bill as okay. Well. All right. We um, we have somebody. Who do we have standing by at the Capitol right now? Oh, Fran Miller is down there. We always love having a chance to talk to you, Senator Miller. Thanks for being with us. My pleasure, Bill. Senator, my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, maybe 45 minutes ago or so, these did the Cab County bills that would carve out uh, uh, La Vista Hills and Tucker were back on the floor uh, in your chamber. Is that right? Well, what's happened is we've had two conference committee reports that are sitting on our desks, uh, where five of the six signatures were uh, attested to that they agreed with the maps, and hopefully we're going to vote on both of the uh, cities tonight. All right, so you're suggesting that, at, that after a year or more of debate over this, we will have finally an outcome tonight. It won't be deferred till 2016 the way it looks right now. I hope so at this point. Uh, you know, a lot of work went into this, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to the referendums. And uh, if both of the referendums pass, and uh, my entire district will then be municipalized. And I'm, I'm out of the city business. <laughs> so is it your sense, uh, you say you're looking forward to the referendums, which voters will have to uh, vote in. Uh, it's your sense right now that uh, the votes are there to uh, send this to the voters for uh, co uh, confirmation, approval? I believe so. The majority of the House uh, signatories, as well as the Senate, we agreed to it. And, I, and I'm hopeful that our, both of our chambers will go along with what we come up with. All right, Senator, thank you very much for joining us tonight. We'll watch eagerly as the evening goes on. When, what's your, when are you going to get out of there, uh, Senator? What time is Sine Die tonight? Well, I think we might get out a little earlier than we usually do. Uh, it's, it hasn't quite been as dramatic as it usually is since we'd already taken up transportation in the budget on day 39. So some of us are optimistic that we can get home in time to, to watch the news, Bill. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much for being with us, as always, Senator. My pleasure, Bill. Um, you know, Howard, one of the interesting things about this, of course, is that there are a lot of reasons people want to incorporate sure. these days. We saw that in Brookhaven. We saw it certainly initially in Sandy Springs. But in the case of DeKalb County, um, the corruption in county government really has been a driving force in a lot of this, hasn't it? It has been. I don't think there's any question about that. I do think interim CEO Lee May has taken some steps to address those things. I think he announced last week through the AJC their, uh, their constituting a report to look into a number of these things. But certainly, you know, the corruption and how much has been covered by the news. I think citizens are very well aware of how their tax dollars are being spent and they have some issues with it. Well, and in fact, that's my question for, for you, Loretta. Um, it, again, we're going to see it, that voters will be the ones who will decide in, in these areas whether they do want to live in La Vista Hills or Tucker. Uh, if Lee May makes efforts to really clean up the Cab County government, do you anticipate that there will be uh, uh, people who will decide not to vote to incorporate? Or do you think the will is there regardless of what DeKalb County does? Well, I'm not as familiar with DeKalb County as I am with Fulton. And I think okay. that the people that are committed to cityhood are committed to cityhood. And That's exactly what I wondered about. Yeah. That it, that, and I think in, in the instances of Lee May and what he's trying to do there in terms of cleaning house and, you know, providing transparency of what's going on in the county, um, I think that that is going to be a long process and may not be finished by the time that the vote takes place. Yeah, I think that that's probably right, isn't I'd it, Howard? Agree, People who want to live in cities yes, want to live in cities. There is a bit of city envy, and we've also <laughs> been on a, on a tear in terms of creating new ones and municipalizing at a, at a pretty quick, you know, pretty fast rate. But what I will also say is that I don't think that ethics or corruption or some of the news stories are driving this in and of itself. I do think folks want local government closer to them, even if they don't necessarily understand what that means just yet. Okay, right. Um, Representative Stacey Abrams, the minority leader in the House, is uh, at our position at the Capitol right now. Representative Abrams, thank you so much for joining us. How are you tonight? I'm well. How are you? I'm great. Um, give us your overview. Uh, if you had to uh, come up with a a couple of sentences about how you think this session has gone for the people of Georgia. What would you tell us? 
I think we've done a lot of good and precious little harm, and I think that's a good balance. <laughs> What's the best thing you've done for the citizens of the state? I, I think what we were able to do on transportation and on transit has moved the state forward. I think there are still some things we need to negotiate and work out in the next few years, just refining how we approach it. But overall, the willingness of the legislature to accept and expand how we think about transportation and transit, I think, is going to be transformative for the state. You had uh, some real uh, hard conversations in the Democratic caucus about the education bill, uh, the governor's uh, bill to rescue failing schools. In the long run, uh, uh, Democrats, uh, for the most part, chose not to uh, support the measure. Where do you f stand right now as this thing gets set to go to uh, uh, the voters down the road? Are you encouraging people? Will you encourage people to vote for it, or do you think this is ill-conceived? I, I think that while the intent is sound, I think the methodology leaves a bit to be desired. Unfortunately, the way the constitutional amendment is drafted, it's overly broad, and it leaves to 91 votes the whims of not the governor that we have now, but a governor we've yet to meet. And any time we do something as dramatic as interfere with local control of education, I think we should be as judicious and as careful as possible. And unfortunately, I don't think the constitutional amendment requires that. Okay. Loretta Lepore is on the set with us. I think she has a quick, quick question for you. Uh, Representative Abrams, um, earlier today, uh, there was an amendment added to the MARTA bill that would um, affect the 1.5% increase uh, that was to transit. That for the MARTA systems, Fulton, DeKalb, and Clayton. Um, I'm wondering why that amendment was end, uh, uh, attached, and I understand that both you and Representative Smyree supported that amendment. Yes, the legislation that added, the amendment that added 1.5 percent on Tuesday night was done very quickly um, after long negotiation, but unfortunately it included a technical error that Unfortunately, given the tenor of today, could not be corrected. We weren't going to have the ability to get that amendment made, adopted, sent over to the Senate, adopted again, and revised. And so what we decided to do was take the best option, which is at least lifting the 50-50. Uh, this has been a 30-year endeavor, and we thought that it was sufficient for the start to get that taken off. And because there is language in the 170 in the new bill that will give transit, especially MARTA, access to the TSPLOS money, we think that's a very good first step. And while we certainly would have wanted to keep the 1.5 percent, the technical issues would have made it impossible to use, and we would have lost everything. And we wanted to make sure we preserved at least the 50-50 amendment. Uh, one last quick question, Representative Abrams. It does appear that the religious freedom uh, bill uh, is not going to get anywhere, although you never can tell in these final hours. Are you, are you uh, relieved, uh, despite the fact that it'll, Josh McCoon says it'll be right back next year? I, I am. I think that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, as it's termed, does not protect religious freedom, but more importantly, it endangers the good work that we can do in the state. We are a state that has always been about tolerance, and at least the conversation has been one of trying to be the leaders on these issues, and I don't want to see us regress, unfortunately. All right. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, what's your guess on what time you get out of there tonight? We're taking when, a poll. Whenever the speaker says. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's not fair. Thank you so much for talking Have with us. Have a good us. night. You too. Um, she has taken some criticism this session. Uh, Howard, I, I go to you as a Democrat. Um, there have been people who wonder why she had, wasn't more outspoken as minority leader. She was very quiet about the education bill until the last minute. Um, do, do you think some of this criticism is uh, valid, or do you think it's just people trying to take her down a peg? I think, I mean, particularly with uh, OSD, the Opportunity School Districts, you know, the devil's in the details. And I think as Democrats are parsing through what it meant whether or not to support it, I think there's still going to be a lot of conversation about how it actually gets uh, fulfilled. I think even as we talk about the referenda that will come up in a, in a year's time or so, there'll be a lot of conversation and holding feet to the fire in terms of how it's actually going to be pursued. So ha I think has, she, has she not been the loyal opposition the way she has in the past? She has not been as outspoken this session as she has been in previous sessions. Well, I think some of the issues, I mean, I, I do agree with Howard that she has throughout her career been very thoughtful mm -hmm. about legislation. And so I do think on the on the school bill that she was having some conflict in her thoughts about wanting to address the issue of failing schools, but was this the right way to do it? And I think that uh, Representative Smyree 
since he took the lead on transportation, he had a higher profile decision. I don't necessarily think that means she had a lower profile or that there was something, some type of schism within the caucus. Certainly, okay. I don't know that. But he just had a higher profile role this year. Okay. I would also just add to that. I think anytime you're the minority party and you're, you know, essentially in a super minority, you know, you're fighting and, and figuring out how much of this is opposition, how much of this is making bad bills better. And I think she's walking a pretty good tightrope tight as it relates to doing that. All right. We, uh, we want to go back down to the Capitol now because we have at our uh, camera position down there the man everyone cannot talk to enough before the budget bill is passed. And then afterward, uh, Representative England, do you become a lonely guy again, or do they still all want to talk to you? <laughs> it, it gets real lonesome, Bill. Right after we get it off the floor and, and sent toward the governor's office, it gets real, real lonesome. <laughs> you know, it, I, I was interested, and of course, you are the head of the House Appro uh, Budget Committee. Uh, and that's why I make those comments. Um, it was interesting to me as a longtime observer of the Capitol that this budget came together uh, you didn't wait until the 40th day on this. The agreement came early. Uh, clearly, there was some negotiating going on, but it seemed to be an awfully smooth uh, uh, process. Are, are we just not seeing what was beneath the waterline? <laughs> a lot of moving pieces this year. Of course, transportation was a big portion of our discussions, uh, not only during the budget, uh, but also, of course, during the bill itself. But uh, Senator Hill and I have been working together now for five years doing the budget, and he kind of knows the things that, that our House members have as priorities, and I know the things that his Senate members have as priorities, so it, it kind of simplifies things a little bit. I mean, they're still tough issues, and actually, in a year like this where revenues are improving, it was a little bit harder than what uh, we've seen in the past when, it, when my, my first four budgets were actually cut budgets. And, you know, everybody just kind of resolves that we're going to have to do that. And so in a year where revenues are improving, it makes it a little tougher. You've got, well, and of course, that's why you were so popular, you and Senator Hill, before the budget actually was crafted. But um, it, it is, you've got a lot of bond money in this budget. Um, are there any concerns about how, how much is it? What's the total now? About $1.1 billion. Yeah. How, is, is there, was there any concern about that amount of bonded indebtedness, or do you feel the state is so healthy you can absorb that pretty easily? No, I mean, we had talked about some other numbers that were higher. I was uncomfortable going higher than that, and I think Senator Hill would agree with me on that. Um, we've, we've been somewhere between 850 and 900 million for the last several years going into this transportation bill and realizing some of the immediate needs. We knew, knew that we needed to do some additional this year. Uh, in bonds to take care of some uh, roads and bridge issues and, and of course put some money in for transit this time as well. But within, you know, staying at 1.1 billion in, in our bonded indebtedness for this year keeps us very, very safely within our, our constraints to maintain our AAA bond rating with right. three bond agents. All right, Representative England, um, you looking forward to getting back to the farm? I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm another, about another four weeks we're going to be in the hay field wide open and it can't get here quick enough. Uh, that sounds a lot better than spending your days under the gold dome. But Amen. thank you so much for joining us today. Glad, glad to be here. Thank <laughs> Take you care. Here. All right. We're going to take a break now, but just before we get to it, 40 days. It's a period of time with recurring biblical significance. Noah endured 40 days and nights of rain. Jesus endured fasting in the desert for 40 days and night. And for at least one lawmaker willing to go on the record, this session of the Georgia General Assembly has been a 40-day endurance test. The reason I believe it's so, uh, so demanding and it's compared to other sessions is that usually if there's a big bill that's being discussed, it's discussed over a whole session. So you have the first year of the session as well as the second year. But the issues that we're dealing with with transportation and school takeover were both get done in the same session and in the first quarter, what we would call the first half. And so usually you have a little bit more time. So if it's not worked out during the interim, you can work it out. But it's been upon us to deal with it. Also, you got different bills that I think is very good dealing with sex trafficking. That issue is an issue that's before. So there's been some good, solid legislation put in, but it's been rapid fire, it started slow, but towards the end, we actually are being bombarded with a lot of bills that's good that we don't want to slip through the, uh, through the uh, what we would say, through the cracks.
This is 88.5 FM, Atlanta's new source for your news and information. Good morning. Let's start the conversation. What's on your mind, Atlanta? We want to hear from you. The news and information you've been looking for is here on 88.5. From Peachtree City to Piedmont Park, from Norcross to Decatur, GPB Atlanta is the source for stories from your community. All news, all information, all day. One thing you have to do is love your job. If you love your job, even on the bad days, it's okay. I'm an executive assistant 24 hours a day, a makeup artist, part-time, and on-call. It allows me to be creative, and I'm proud of that. I like doing makeup because it makes people feel good about themselves. If I can make somebody smile, I love it. I'm Tiffany brown Rideau, executive assistant and makeup artist here at GPB. hard to let go, but donate your old vehicle to GPB and we'll roll out the red carpet. Call 877-472-1227 or visit gpb.org slash donate. Welcome back to our special one hour long sine die edition of Lawmakers. Here tonight on set, Republican activist Loretta Lepore and Democratic strategist Howard Franklin. Uh, before we get a chance to talk again with the two of you, uh, we want to go back down to the Capitol, Pat St. Clair, uh, as we, I'm sorry, I'm being told we're going to go talk to Senator Renee Unterman first because she is standing in our camera position. Senator, are you there? Senator, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you for being with us. If, if you have a problem hearing, just let us know. Are you can okay? Can you turn it up? Can we, uh, can we get Senator Enterman a little more? How you doing there, Senator? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Good. Thank you for being with us. I hear your voice is really shaky after a 40-day session, but let's talk a minute. Tell us about the uh, sex trafficking bill that we finally saw come to fruition today. Well, we're really excited because we passed Senate Bill 8 and Senate Resolution 7, and it's a historic bill because it's about child sex trafficking and safe harbor, giving children therapeutic services when they need it. Senator, you had some real success this session, I think it's fair to say, and as we've said before, your passionate causes finally happened in the best way possible for you. Uh, you were very involved in the autism bill. You're going to get insurance for uh, ch families that have children with autism. You were very helpful to Alan Peak and the medical marijuana bill. This feels like it was a very good session for you. Are you feeling like you're coming away having some uh, uh, real success? Well, it's really not about me, but it has been a very successful session, but it's successful for the children of Georgia because not only did we do autism, medical marijuana, we did the Hidden Predator Act, we did the School Opportunity Zone, we've done foster care. So it's just a culmination of all of these issues finally coming together for the children in Georgia. And not just me, but all 56 senators were just so excited and Casey Cagle could not be more elated to get all of these issues resolved in one session. All right, Senator Underman, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I hope they get you out of there a little earlier than midnight. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Okay, um, she did have a great session, obviously, um, and you know she uh, defers credit, which she should, but, but she was behind a lot of this stuff herself. And a lot of the things she'd been working on for quite some time. Yeah, yeah. So um, now Pat St. Clair is back with us. Um, as we uh, discussed earlier in the show, she uh, had an extended interview with Governor Deal today. And so we want to go back down to the Capitol to talk to Pat to uh, lead us into uh, the next part of her interview with the governor. You're back there now, aren't you, Pat? Good. Tell us about your conversation with Governor Deal. Well, Bill, as we continue our conversation with the governor, one of the things we talked about was that issue of religious liberty. As you know, governors in Indiana and Arkansas have refused to sign similar bills without changes. So we asked the governor if he would have signed SB 129 if it had been passed by the legislature. You know, I don't speculate on what a bill might look like or what, it, what I would do with a bill that I don't know what it's going to contain. I will say this, as I've said consistently before, I was a member of Congress when the first uh, religious freedom bill was presented in Congress, and I voted for it uh, in 1993.
President Clinton signed the bill at that time. Uh, and I think some 34 or so states have adopted similar uh, provisions in their states over the years since the Supreme Court said that that federal legislation only had application to the federal government and to not activities in the state. Um, I have said that if a bill uh, like the one I voted on in Congress came to my desk, I would sign it. But by the same token, it has taken on a connotation and discussions that I think, in, maybe on both sides even, uh, are not really at the heart of the issue. I don't want our state to be known as a state that discriminates against anybody. I don't think the bill would allow that. Uh, but by the same token, I want our state to be recognized as one that protects the religious freedoms of its citizens. Uh, and that was the intent of the legislation. So uh, I don't believe it's going to come to my desk this year based on what I've seen in the last couple of hours. But nevertheless, it is an issue that is worthy of debate, and it has had that. There is a, a very uh, divisive issue, and we've seen it play out in other states. If it does not come to my desk this year, I have every expectation that it probably will be an issue next year. <laughs> most, most assuredly, I'm <laughs> sure. Um, let's talk about criminal justice reform. That is something that is very close to your heart. I know you've made a speech sure. earlier this week about it, and it just seems like something that is that is just just a prized project with you. Tell us a little bit about why you are so compassionate and passionate about criminal justice reform. Well, for one thing, it's one of those image issues for our state. Uh, when I came into office, we were at that time the tenth largest population state but we had the fourth highest prison population. I sort of half jokingly say, I don't think we're that much meaner than other people in other states. But the statistics were rather alarming. We were spending about $1.2 billion a year to incarcerate people in our prison system. Uh, we were sending people to $18,000 a year prison beds, even though we classify them as nonviolent. I think when you tell most people that, they would say, well, that just doesn't fit. Uh, that, that just is something we can't understand. So I've been a prosecutor. I have sent prison people to prison as a prosecutor. I've also been a juvenile court judge, and I have seen families and juveniles confronted with the system many times where there were no options. We have provided options now to a, a juvenile court judge, and we have tried to divert both in the adult population and in the juvenile population to divert them from a life of crime. Now, <clears throat> to tie in the Opportunity School District to this, when we started looking at our prison population, we found that almost seven out of every 10 who are in our prisons had dropped out of school. Now, the, the likelihood that a child that's in a chronically failing school is not gonna graduate is pretty high. And therefore, the likelihood with someone who drops out of school winding up in our prison system is likewise very high. We have, in criminal justice reform, we have tried to deal with the problem once they are in the juvenile justice system or once they're in the adult system. The Opportunity School District gives us a chance to start to divert them at a very early age so that they don't drop out of school. But, you know, we passed this in three separate legislative sessions. The first year, the bill passed unanimously. Second year, it passed unanimously. The third year, it passed with only about three dissenting votes. Uh, you just don't find that kind of bipartisan support for things that are major issues as we got. And I am very, very proud of the members of the General Assembly who gave it an opportunity to work. Well, one thing I, I have heard as I've talked to different lawmakers throughout this session, they say that you have an inclusive style of leadership. Do you think that contributes to everybody getting along? Uh, well, maybe not getting along totally, but for the spirit of cooperation that seems to exist here at the Georgia General Assembly, it is far different than a lot of other legislatures. Well, I, I take that as a great compliment, and I hope that that's the case. Uh, I do think it's better to talk things out rather than just uh, go to your corners, your separate corners, and stare at each other. That doesn't serve people this state very well. Are we always going to get what we want? No. Even if you have a supermajority, you're not always going to get what you want. Um, but I do think that we have seen cooperation. Uh, in some cases, I wish we had more cooperation. I think it would advance our causes much faster. 
But sometimes uh, you have to work through the system, and that's what every session of the General Assembly involves, is allowing the system to work, hopefully with the right input, the right information, and the right point of view. We were not sent here, the governor, lieutenant governor, nor the members of the General Assembly, we were not sent here to fight. We were sent here to solve the problems of the people of this state. Now sometimes we have disagreements as to how to fix those problems, and that may appear to be a fight. But those are legitimate discussions. But if, he, if everybody has a mindset of goodwill, of taking their job and their responsibilities seriously to advance the state of this state, then uh, we get a lot done. And I'm, I'm proud that over my first term and now in the beginning of this second term, that we're getting a lot of positive and good things done. You know, Bill, we also asked the governor about his legacy, what he thinks it will be. He said that will take care of itself. So that's it from here. All right, Pat, thank you for your final report in this 40th day of the legislative <laughs> session. So the top clock is ticking down rapidly towards sine die. And as it does, we wanted to share with you one more person of interest down at the Gold Dome. Our Lisa Clark, the show writer for Lawmakers, met a man, a legislator who's all about watching the clock, but not in the way you might think. Lisa? Well, Bill, you know, we work in live television and we know time waits for no man. But I have to tell you, maybe not, but there are a trove of Georgia time pieces who've been clearly waiting for a guy like Representative Brooks Coleman to come along. It's a session that's been dominated by big issues, education and transportation. Uh, but at the same time, there have been bill after bill after bill uh, that... Uh, give all right, we had a little bit of a tape kerfuffle. I guess you guys can't imagine what that's like around here today. <laughs> so, all right, we're going to take a look at State Rep Brooks Coleman and his passion for clocks. Stabilize it. Stabilize it, whoa. Whoa, baby. Representative Brooks Coleman, who lives in Duluth, was elected to represent District 97 in 1992. Before the Georgia General Assembly, he had a long and distinguished career as an educator in Gwinnett County. He holds five degrees, including a Ph.D. from Georgia State. He also has experience as a motivational speaker and an auctioneer, which you can kind of guess once he starts talking. And then I started going to auctions and flea markets. and In those days, back in the 70s and early 80s, you could really find a lot of old antique clocks. Coleman went straight to Governor Zell Miller's office and asked if his club could have and restore the clock. Miller said yes. The club he meant is the National Association of Watch and Clock Collectors, a group of folks who sure know their way around all the intricate bells and gears and pendulums, which is why that old beat-up in-pieces clock now looks like this and stands majestically in the governor's office. One thing led to another and another and another. Apart from Coleman and his trusted friend Preston Colmore, no one is allowed to touch these valuable antiques. Kevin Coleman only has one rule uh, regarding the grandfather clock that we have in our office, and that is never touch it. <laughs> when the governor's clock was finally finished and ready for installation and dedication, Sonny Perdue was holding office and commented. And he said, gentlemen, we have a lot of clocks in the governor's mansion that aren't, and said so none of them are working. So would y'all be willing to take that project on? So that comment led to a project that straddled administrations and earned Coleman a devoted fan in First Lady Sandra Deal. After Brooks restored a family treasure, a small clock that had belonged to her grandmother, one that she vividly remembered from her childhood. My grandfather died when I was just in first grade. Mm -hmm. All of us took turns spending the night with my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And this was in her bedroom, and she would wind it, and she would, uh, we would hear those, the dongs go off all during the night. That's just one of nearly a dozen beautiful timepieces at the governor's mansion, all painstakingly refurbished by Coleman and his clock club buddies, including George Waterhouse and Chris Brown. We got a tour along with some highly detailed and occasionally opinionated background. Uh, this is one of the clocks we found in the attic. Mm -hmm. It was in storage, and in fact, somebody had put a quartz movement in it, and they discarded the original French movement. Heresy! <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good word for it. As a, a lawmaker, I want to ask you if you see any similarities between making laws and repairing clocks. <laughs> Very time-consuming. <laughs> Messy at times. 
all the gears have to be right in place to make it work. That is a good analogy. Thank you for asking that. I, I think that in a clock, you have to have, it has to be in beat by that. You know, that's the ticking right. And the legislature, you have to have the beat right with the governor, the Senate, and the House. Uh, all the gears have to mesh, and all the, the communication has to be there. And then when, the, and when they're fully restored and the governor signs it, that's the bill. <laughs> TikTok. <laughs> and they start ticking. Exactly. <laughs> TikTok, I got to get out of here. Go to our website, gpb.org, for lots more with Representative Coleman and all of the clocks. Bill, back to you. All right, Lisa, really good to get you out on this last day of the session. So day, day 40 is not quite over, but we're going to say good night here in our TV studio. But if you want to keep watching until the final gavel drops, just go over to our website, gpb.org slash lawmakers. You can click on either the House or the Senate and watch live streams as they go to Sine die. Thanks to Loretta Lepore and Howard Franklin. Good night. TV original production.